And now I'd like to take a few seconds to introduce uh, Roger Fernandez. Uh, he will be hosting this event today. He's a Native American artist, storyteller, and educator whose work focuses on traditional arts, legends, and teaching of the Coast Salish tribes of the Puget Sound region of Western Washington. He is a member of the Lower Elwha Klalem Klalem tribe. Uh, he has a degree in Native American studies from the Evergreen State College and master's degree in whole system design from Antar? Antioch University. He has also studied graphic design at the University of Washington and has focused on learning, creating, and teaching Coast Salish art for the past 20 years. So, uh, Roger, if you want to come up here. And then also, uh, Now, I try not to use a microphone unless the uh, room people can't hear me. So can people in the back hear me all right? Good. Because I was taught by my teachers, when I speak from my heart to your heart, I want nothing between us. No technology. We just speak to each other. There's this thing called the sacred breath, the teaching of our people. We share the same breath. That's the most powerful time when we communicate. But of course, you know, we share the breath with the animals, the plants, the trees. We share our breath with them. And that's something that um, has helped me understand how I'm supposed to live in the world. So I won't use a microphone. Uh, I do teach a class here on Native American storytelling, uh, Monday, Wednesday evening. I'm happy to see some of my students are here. I might ask them to volunteer and come up and help me. We'll see. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am from a tribe called the Lower Elwha. That's a river outside of Port Angeles. Lower Elwha, Clallam people. But like a lot of the tribes, our names are mispronounced because the English speakers couldn't say them. Our real name is not Clallam. Clallam County is named after us. Our real name is Nuxclayam. And Nuxclayam, I guess you could see where Nuxclayam, Clallam came close, I guess. But our real name is Nuxclayam, which means strong people. The city of Seattle is named after who? Chief Seattle, not his real name. His real name is Siak. There's a cut at the end, Siak. For the city of Seattle, they couldn't figure out how to do a cut in English, so they said Seattle, close enough. So again, that misunderstanding starts really basically simply with even pronouncing our names, our words. And so those are kind of things that we're hoping your generation can change, using our real names, um, speaking our language, instead of us only having to speak yours. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I. Took a long route to become a storyteller. I studied graphic design at the University of Washington, which led me to learn more and more about Native people and uh, Native art. Then I became an artist, but to learn the artwork, you gotta learn the story, so I learned the stories. And then I began to become a storyteller. And so, um, but at the bottom of all this, I believe people, uh, people need to understand. I'm not here to put on a show for you. This is not a show, I'm not an actor, I'm not a performer. I'm not an entertainer, although you will be entertained, don't worry about it, okay? Mm -hmm. I am a teacher. Storytelling is teaching. It's the oldest kind of teaching there is. You know that reading and writing have only been around for the past few thousand, a couple, three thousand years, maybe more, but writing and reading were kept by the higher class people to control those of us who, anyway. But now we accept it as a given. Reading and writing are how we communicate, how we share and learn. But imagine, what did human beings do before that? To remember, to share, to teach, to learn, they told stories. Within the stories, they kept all the knowledge they needed. And so, that's why I'm a storyteller, to keep those old ways alive as best I can. And looking at the um, topic of today, looking at the intent of today, to talk about how human beings today, we suffer trauma. We have things, our minds, our bodies, our spirits cannot, cannot really, um, uh, uh, handle, that's trauma, that's what been fine to me, that something that happens to your mind, your spirit, or your body that your, your system can't can incorporate. There's a struggle there, a painful struggle, and um, how, do we, how do we address that? For Native people, the trauma of a genocide against our people where, depending on who you're talking to, in the Western Hemisphere, up to 100 million Natives were killed in the conquest, as the Western people called it, of the New World. And this region right here, the Puget Sound region up to Alaska, the Northwest Coast, 
A lot of people who study this said this was probably the most densely populated region of native people in the Americas. The most densely populated because this region we live in is a paradise with salmon and clams and oysters and deers and berries. Everything you need to live in the world was right here, is right here. But when the great plagues of diseases that the Europeans introduced came through here, people theorized that 80% of our people died. 80%. A village of 100 people, at the end of a year, 20 people left. And so again, that's trauma. You see your people dying around you in terrible ways, caused by diseases. You see people being taken away to prison, your children taken from me to go to, their, go to the boarding schools. You see all these things happen. Your mind, your body, your spirit cannot, cannot deal with it. That is trauma. And trauma never goes away. Trauma stays with you because it's, 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 it's part of you now. And this is what I learned a long time ago. You pass it on to the next generation. Without knowing it, without meaning to, you pass it on to the next generation. And they pass it on to the next generation. So trauma is not a condition. You can take a pill and it's gone. You cannot unkill people. You cannot, you cannot get rid of that painful thing that caused the trauma. So I was taught the best thing you can do for trauma, and I know this is a field that people are studying, so it might, might have changed since I first learned about it, is to talk and tell your story of that struggle, of that pain, of that suffering to other people who share it with you. And that way you relieve some of the pressure that I'm, I'm at least able to tell the story of my suffering, my pain. So again, trauma is a powerful thing. The African American beauty has it because their ancestors were taken from Africa and enslaved in very cruel ways. Many, many of them died. And so that struggle continues that day to deal with that trauma. And the Native American people, the same thing. So all groups have to look at their history and realize what terrible things happened in the past might be still working with us today. But the Native people, way back in the day, way before Columbus landed, they're human beings. And because they're human beings, they tell human stories. And so within their stories, hopefully another human being can hear it and learn from that story as we can learn from any cultural story that speaks from a human being to another human being. So I'm going to tell you a story um, with the idea of what we're talking about today, the idea of trauma, of finding strength, of, uh, of all these things we're going to talk about, struggle. This happens because we're human. And so I found, I, a story found me. A story found me that allows me to talk about certain concepts that outside the story are really hard to talk about. But we talk about them through the story, it makes that a little bit easier. We can find a way to converse and talk, so I'm just going to do it. I'm going to tell this story. This story is from out around here. I learned this story from a native storyteller. His name is Gene Tagaban. He's from Alaska. But he learned it from a storyteller in California who is really from uh, uh, Oklahoma. So this story went from Oklahoma to California to Alaska now to here. This story is traveling with the storytellers. And if you remember this story, you want to tell it, please do. It'll travel with you. So I'm just going to tell the story. Now I have many of my class here, so they know what we do. We talk about the story when it's done. So you guys might get it started, all right? We'll see. So, a long time ago, the animals had a big problem. The animals had a big problem in their village, and no one could solve the problem. They all talked about it. They all worked on it. They all tried to figure it out because it affected all of them, this big problem. But um, they couldn't find an answer. They could not solve this problem. Well, the animals know, as we should know, if you have a big problem one person cannot solve, is what you do is you go to the big house, probably about the size of this room right here, a big house in the middle of the village. And in the middle of the big house is always a fire. So everyone goes to the big house. They sit around the fire in a big circle, and they talk about the problem. One by one, everyone stands up to talk about the problem, one by one. Everyone gives their thoughts, their ideas, their solutions. And through that, the people find the idea, the solution, because all of us have a chance to speak. So that's how you solve a big problem. Go to the big house, sit around the fire in a big circle, and one by one, everyone stands up to talk about the problem. So the animals did this. They start talking about the problem inside the big house, when from outside the house, they hear this noise. Adam say, what is up? Who's making all that noise outside? And the animals go outside. And standing outside the house, a little rabbit with his hand drum singing and playing really loud. The animals say, little rabbit, you got to be quiet. We're having a big meeting in the house. It's really important. You're making too much noise out here, little rabbit. 
you can see when we're all done. So little rabbit, be quiet. So the animals go back into the house. They sit around the fire in a big circle. They start talking about the problem. When from outside the house they hear, I'm saying, what is up with that rabbit? He's still out there making noise. Somebody make him be quiet. Bear, I'll take care of the rabbit. I know what to do. And Bear lumbers out of the house and says, little rabbit, we totally be quiet. We're having a big meeting. You're making too much noise out here, little rabbit. And little rabbit is listening to Bear talk. And when Bear is done talking, little rabbit goes, <laughs> So Bear reaches over, grabs one of rabbit's arms, and pulls it off. You'll get your arm back when the meeting is over. Now you be quiet, little rabbit. Goes back into the house. To care of that rabbit, he only has one arm, can't play his drum, and he can't bother us now. So the animals start the meeting again. When from outside the house they hear, <laughs> he's holding the drum between his legs, still singing really loud, and the animals are getting more angry. What is up with him? Somebody make me quiet. Wolf, I'll take care of the rabbit. And Wolf goes outside and says, Little Rabbit, you're still making noise. You've got to be quiet. But Little Rabbit's still playing like this. So Wolf reaches over, grabs Rabbit's other arm, and pulls it off. You'll get this arm back when the meeting is over. Now you be quiet, Little Rabbit. Goes back to the house. Took care of the rabbit. No arm. Can't play his drum, and he can't bother us now. So the animals start the meeting again. When from outside the house they hear, Little rabbit stomping his foot, so singing really loud. And now the animal's getting very angry. He's still out there making noise. Somebody take care of that rabbit. Coyote, I'll take care of him. Coyote goes outside and says, Little rabbit, you gotta be quiet. But little rabbit keeps stomping his foot like this. So Coyote reaches over, grabs one rabbit's legs, and pulls it off. You'll get your leg back. The midi's over. You be quiet, little rabbit. Go back in the house. Take care of the rabbit. No, no arms, one leg, can't bother us now. So they start the meeting again. When from outside the house they hear, Whoa, whoa, he yo, whoa, 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 he yo. Little rabbit's hopping around on one leg, singing really loud. And now the animals are very angry. Somebody make that rabbit be quiet. Make him be quiet now. Eagle, I'll take care of the rabbit once and for all. And Eagle goes outside and says, Little rabbit. But little rabbit hopping around on one leg, so Eagle reaches over, grabs the rabbit's head, and pulls it off. You'll get your head back when the meeting is over. <clears throat> now you be quiet, little rabbit. Goes back in the house. Took care of the rabbit, no head, no arms, one leg, can't bother us now. Let's finish the meeting. And so, the animals start the meeting again. When from outside the house they hear this little noise. Whoa, whoa, he yo, whoa, 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 he yo. And then the animals realize something. They realize something. They realize that song was coming from rabbit's heart. That was a song in his heart to sing. And so the animals realized everything they did to that little rabbit was wrong. Because if something comes from someone's heart, there's nothing you can do to stop it. In fact, if you're their friend, you should be helping them. So the animal felt really bad. Everything they did was wrong. They went, went back outside and an eagle put back rabbit's head. Bear and wolf put back rabbit's arms. Coyote said, it's almost lunchtime. Can I keep the leg? They said, no, give it back to rabbit. So there were little rabbit, all put back together. He got his drum. He taught the animals a song, and they sang it with him. It's a gambling song, because Little Rabbit, obviously a gambler. <laughs> and that is all the story called The Little Rabbit. So I told you that story to teach you something. But my job is not to explain it to you. You have to figure it out. You have to figure out the meanings within the story that might relate to the topic we're here to talk about or other elements of your life. You have to figure that out. My job, real simple. I tell the story, your job, more complicated. Figure it out. Why did the storyteller tell that story at this event? Why did the animals behave a certain way? What was rabbit doing? You have to figure all that out. And the cool thing about that is each one of you in this room might have a different thing you learned in the story. And that is the power of storytelling. I'm not here to tell you, here's the answer. I'm telling you, asking you, what answer did you find in this story? So now my class is here. I'm going to ask them the model. What's happening in the story to you? Anything jump out in terms of what you think the story is teaching? Some of my class. Um, <clears throat> sometimes traumatic events can take away your ability to do things, but you'll still find a way to do it if, you'll, if you really love it. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to stand up and say that when we paraphrase it for you, because that, that was good. He says, sometimes traumatic events prevent you from doing the work you want to do, but something else, you're... You'll find a way you'll to... You'll find a way do it. to get the work done regardless. So sometimes we have to work through that trauma to get work done. Wonderful. Did Little Rabbit, in all the things he did, did anyone ask Little Rabbit, why are you doing what you're doing? Did anyone? No, they didn't. So the Little Rabbit had to work that out. He was sending them a message. He was trying to teach them something. Any other thoughts here? Any other thoughts from the room? Yeah, what do you think is happening in the story for you? Uh, I think that <coughs> when they're doing the meeting, mm -hmm. it's only the animal. So uh -huh. the rabbit was also the animal to a part of it. So for them, rabbit was just a symbol. Uh, so they should also add it to the meeting instead of keeping it outside. Okay. So basically I'm trying to say that in the society right now, we should care about every human being. Not okay. about different color, not about different money thing, not about different culture even. We should take care of all the human beings together. Thank you. Hopefully you heard him, the idea that Little Rabbit was excluded from that important meeting. And maybe because he's little, maybe he has no power, maybe he's a troublemaker, who knows, but he was kept away from the meeting. And he's saying, but if you're gonna solve this problem, every voice has to be heard. Every person has to be listened to, regardless of income, or education, or gender, or whatever it is, include every voice. And so sometimes we forget that. We allow other people to speak for us. And they are very exclusive in the way they operate. So again, listen to every voice. Wonderful. Any other thoughts about this story? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, my original thoughts are about genocide. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from Bosnia. Mm, okay. And so sharing that, the idea that um, the community at the end of the story, did they learn something that Rabbit expected them to learn? And again, a simple apology sometimes, we're sorry we didn't mean to, is that really sufficient to face trauma? That, oh, we're sorry. Now, that's a whole other conversation, but I'm glad you brought it up. How do people apologize? How do we accept the apology? How do we move forward after the apology has been accepted? Because so many terrible traumatic things have happened in so many groups that it's really sometimes symbolic to offer an apology, but maybe it's the start of something, that the change can come out of that. But one of the stories I share, uh, a young boy is abused by his uncle, um, beaten and starved, and, and, and uh, his little spirit is attacked. His uncle calls him stupid and ugly. At the end of the story, the uncle apologizes. <coughs> I should never have done those things. The elders told me I was wrong. The boy does not want to accept the apology because he remembers the pain of that. But another character assures him your uncle is telling you the truth. So again, that idea of apology, that idea of um, trying to make atonement for this, that's a whole other conversation into itself. Any other thoughts about this story? Because there's a lot. Way in the back, yeah, what do you see? We dissect this story from the beginning. We're so interested in the process and the group and the majority. The animals knew the process was to come together because no one should have the answer. But they were so interested in getting to the process Okay. It's not always correct to get to the process that that process occurred and they were listening. Okay. That process, uh huh? Yeah. So he was standing up for something he wanted to present to the group. And I love the connection of these ideas. It makes me see the stories in new lights. But I'll tell you what one. 10-year-old boy told me when he heard this story. Kids love this story because a little rabbit being torn apart by a bunch of animals, they like that. But <laughs> he said, the animals had a problem to solve. And they went to the big house to solve the problem. 
So the big house became, because they were trying to solve the problem with their brain. And the big house became this big brain trying to solve this big problem. He said, but Rabbit didn't want to go to that meeting. He stood outside drumming and singing. And Little Rabbit was telling them, the problem's not with your brain, it's with your heart. This is where the problem lies. You're approaching it in a way that's not going to solve the problem. Little Rabbit was trying to tell them that. But by doing that, they began to punish him, tearing off his arms and legs. This little kid's explaining this to me. And that's what storytelling can do. It allows you to be philosophical, and children are natural philosophers. So this little boy's explaining, and I said that, his perspective shifted my entire understanding of the story. That we look at racism. I don't believe it's a purely intellectual exercise. In fact, science put out some reports a few years ago that said, well, actually, race is not a, you can't use science to validate it because it really doesn't exist. It's a, it's a social construct. And so the idea that racism can be solved here, well, it needs to be solved here at some point, but it really needs to be addressed in here, in my opinion. And until we can speak about these topics from here and not purely put into words and laws and numbers, then we might be speaking the wrong language to solve the problem. I'm not saying I have the answer. If I did, I would tell you. I really would, but I don't. All I know is the story reminds me. How do we solve the problem of racism in here? What language do we use in here as we speak to each other? And again, we live in a culture that dismisses this and glorifies this. So the answer is in here. Um, so that little boy helped me understand something. So I took it some more. Because once someone puts me on a path of understanding the story, I take it again. A couple years ago, um, Bernie Sanders was running for a Democratic nomination for president. He came to Seattle. He was speaking at Westlake Park. And a few thousand people showed up here to speak. But before he got to the microphone, two African-American women jumped up, ran up, grabbed the microphone, and said, we got something to say. And Bernie Sanders, either in his wisdom or whatever, he backed away, let them speak. And they said, we're from Black Lives Matter. We're here to talk about something nobody wants to talk about. And that is the acts of violence against our people. And um, they talked about the police shootings in the street of unarmed men, women, and children across the country, and nobody seemed to care. And so people vilified them in the news and social media. How dare they jump up and talk about the? How dare they grab the mic? They were attacked for bringing up this very important topic that no one wanted to talk about. And I looked at them and I said, the little rabbit right here. The little rabbit is right here. It just came from their heart. They're speaking of four, 400 years of suffering of a people and we're still not doing anything about it. For the native people, it'll be the same message for 500 years. But whatever it is, this country doesn't want to address it at pretty much any level. So that reminded me. All right. Then I looked at more people. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a little rabbit. Because you're all young, you probably didn't exist when he was there, when he was doing his work. I remembered he was not beloved in America. Nobody said, we're going to make a special day for you on your birthday. We're going to close down the post office. They never said that. They said, go back to Africa, is that what you want? How dare you talk about a race? So can you be quiet? He was ultimately killed, as you know, because he refused to back down. He refused to give up the words from his heart on behalf of his people. And I looked and said, the little rabbit. There he is again. Colin Kaepernick, refusing to uh, stand for the national anthem because I believe he interpreted it as a, a false anthem if it didn't serve everyone. And in his conscience, he couldn't do it. Is he ever going to play pro football again? No, I don't think he is. But he knew that. I knew he knew that, that this was the, cost he might, the price he might have to pay. But that little rabbit, Colin Kaepernick, knelt and said, I'm not going to do this. My conscience will not let me. But of course, he was vilified. He was cussed out. He was accused by our president of being an SOB. All these kind of things he was willing to tolerate because he had a message to share. For Native people, there's a place called uh, uh, Standing Rock, a reservation over in uh, uh, South Dakota. And um, a pipeline was being built to the reservation. And so these Native people gathered. They said, we have to stop the pipeline because if the pipeline ever ruptures, it will contaminate the water beneath it. And it will pollute the land and the water. We have to stand up to this. They went unarmed against police, dogs, against fire hoses, against uh, rubber bullets, against helicopters. They did it because they're the little rabbit, in my opinion. So the little rabbit has always been around us. This story allows us to talk about this topic through the story with the little rabbit kind of standing in for hopefully who we can be, that we would be willing to stand up to injustice as we see it, 
see that we are willing to, to, to frame things in such a way that we reach the hearts of other people. And be willing to be, again, vilified. You're having your arms torn off, having your head torn off. The idea that they were trying to silence you, they didn't want to hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So the little rabbit to me, um, I hope I have the courage of the little rabbit. I really do. So you understand what I'm trying to do with the story here? Through this story, we can get philosophical. Through this story, we can, we, can, we can extrapolate and start to talk about other topics. We can bring history into it. We can bring all kinds of topics into this where the story allows us to talk that way. So that little rabbit story is a story of hope to me. It's a story of hope to me because we need little rabbits. And um, like I said, I hope when that time comes, I can be a little rabbit. And I can say, this is wrong. This is wrong. We can't do this anymore. Um, the Me Too movement of women being able to hear their story and be heard after generations of being told to be quiet, keep it a secret, we don't want you to tell anybody, that is a powerful little rabbit movement as well. So for me then, there's so many ways to take this story and say, here's the little rabbit right now, right in front of us. But then that turns around to me and says, will I be the little rabbit? Will I, will I have the courage to do that? So then I use storytelling to try to connect these very, very old stories with who we are today. Because they do. They were told by human beings, we're human beings, therefore, they should touch us at a level that maybe it's hard for us to explain. So I've learned different stories from all around Native America here, and I've also learned stories from other cultures. Um, some of them I heard from, a, uh, like from Africa, I heard an African storyteller from the Maasai people tell this story, um, and I, I learned it because I heard him tell it, and then like a couple weeks later I found a book. I said, this story's trying to track me down here. I better learn it. So I'm going to tell you a story that I learned from Africa, uh, the Maasai people of uh, uh, Central Kenya. And uh, people say, why is a Native American storyteller telling African stories? Well, first off, they're human. Second off, they live in villages. Third off, they fish and hunt. and they, They're just like us. They're just on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. So many connections that are there that I want to hear their stories because I know within those stories I might learn something. So this story, I love this little story. A long time ago, Rabbit, little rabbit, another rabbit. <laughs> rabbit <laughs> built his house. Rabbit loved his house. It was a beautiful little house. He made this little house, and uh, he he was always cleaning it, and fixing it. And he was always inviting friends over and having dinner with people. He he loved his little house. One day, Rabbit left his house, and Rabbit went out to the woods to gather food. While he was gone, a little caterpillar came creeping into Rabbit's house. The caterpillar looked around and said, "I like Rabbit's house. It's a really nice house." I'm going to stay here. So the caterpillar crept up the house post, went to the rafters of the house, the boards of the roof of the house, lay down among the boards at the top of the house, and went to sleep. Rabbit came back. He saw there was a little trail going into his house, but none was coming out. So Rabbit went into his house and said, who is in my house? No answer. So he was louder. Who is in my house? And he woke, woke up the caterpillar. And the caterpillar did not show himself. He was hiding in the shadows of the boards the, at the roof of the house. But the caterpillar said in a very loud voice, I'm a great and terrible monster. I'm a great and terrible warrior. Get out of this house before I eat you up and chew your bones in the dust. The rabbit said, wait a minute, this is my house. You get And the voice came out, I'm a great and terrible monster. A great and terrible warrior. Get out of this house before I eat you up and chew your bones into dust. And rabbit ran out of the house. Oh no, a terrible monster has taken over my house. What can I do? What can I do? I've lost, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jackal is the smartest of all the animals. Jackal can help me. So, Rabbit went and found Jackal and explained, a terrible monster has taken my house, Jackal. Can you help me get my house back? And Jackal said, I will help you, Rabbit. They came back, Jackal put his, his head into Rabbit's house and said, who is in Rabbit's house? And out of the darkness came that voice again. I'm a great and terrible monster, a great and terrible warrior. Get out of this house before I eat you up and chew your bones into dust. And Jackal pulled his head out and said, I've never heard a monster like that. That is terrible. And he ran out to the woods. Rabbit sitting there, oh no, who can help? Lion. Lion is big and strong and brave. Lion will help me. So he got Lion. Lion came back, put his head in the rabbit's house, said, who is in rabbit's house? The voice came out of the darkness. I'm a great and terrible monster. A great, and Lion pulled his head. I've never heard a voice like that. It sounds so powerful. I can't help you, Rabbit. And Lion ran away. Rabbit is crying, who can help me, not jackal, not elephant. Elephant is the biggest and strongest of all the animals. Elephant can do it. And so he 
He found an elephant. The elephant came back, put his head in Rabbit's door and said, who is in Rabbit's house? The voice came out of the darkness again. I'm a great and terrible monster. A great and elephant pulled his head out. If this monster is not afraid of me, and I'm the biggest and strongest of all the beings, it must truly be a great monster. An elephant ran away. So there was little rabbit, sitting there crying and crying, I've lost my house, nobody can help me, not jackal, not lion, not elephant. And then he heard a little voice. Hello, rabbit. And he turned around, and there was a little frog. A little frog. Little frog said, rabbit, why are you crying? Oh, I lost my house to a terrible monster. Nobody can help me, not jackal, not lion, not elephant. Little frog said, let me talk to the monster. And, and rabbit said, no, little frog, you can't do it. It'll, it'll eat you like your little piece of candy or something. But little frog said, I will talk to the monster. And little rabbit hopped into rabbit's house and said, who is in rabbit's house? And the voice came out of the darkness. I'm a great and terrible monster, a great and terrible. Little frog said, show me your face. I want to see who you are. The voice came out again, I'm a great and terrible. No, no, show me your face. I want to see who you are. And little caterpillar leaned over the boards and said, it's just me, caterpillar. <laughs> and little frog said, you should be ashamed of yourself. You get out of rabbit's house right now. So a little caterpillar came creeping down the house post, creeping out the door. And how do you think Rabbit felt when he saw the terrible monster coming out of his house? How do you feel Jackal and Lion and Elephant felt? Because they were hiding in the woods, watching the whole thing unfold. And that is all the story I call the terrible monster. So again, I tell you these stories that don't have anything to do with our topic, but at a deeper level, I believe they do. They do. We have a culture that is afraid to confront some of the terrible things they've done in the past, their history, they've hidden it. They've hidden it for so long, in my opinion. They've hidden it for so long, now the stories are starting to come out. We people of color, of different groups, we women, transgender, all kinds of people are coming out and saying, this is my story. You've told me to be quiet for so long, but I'm gonna tell you my story now. And for me, when we really want to get to know other people, we must hear their stories. So the story about the little rabbit is fascinating to me. It's about transformation. It is about changing, how rapid change, but also how change itself happens. And so hopefully, again, we don't need to um, analyze every story, but to realize within the story there are teachings. There are things that your human ancestors sent in the story to teach you right now. They knew you would be here. I was taught by my Indian teachers that our ancestors knew you would be here, and you would need the stories to help you learn to live in the world. That's why they sent us the stories. So my class knows this, I'm going to share with you. I hope, I challenge you to look at the stories of your ancestors, to look at those old ancient stories, because those people understood that they were connected to the earth beneath them. And out of the earth beneath them came these stories that helped them understand how to live in the world. And that is a wisdom. Now we don't do much wisdom. Do you have a wisdom class here at Highland? Do we have a class on just wisdom? I didn't think so. Wisdom is something you gain through experience and learning and your human heart. And so wisdom is something that I think we sorely need now. We can do facts and data and reports and those kind of things, but in my opinion, those things don't feed your heart. Your brain appreciates them because it helps it shape what we need to do, but your heart needs to be moved first. So again, I tell the story because they come from the heart. I'm telling them from my heart to your heart. I said, that's why I need the microphone. I want that to be pure and, and, and good. So I'll tell you one more story. This story, um, Again, my job is to tell the story. Your job is to figure it out and then connect it to our topic today, the idea of we have trauma among many of our communities and we're struggling to correct the, the course of the world, the course of this country's history. We're trying to uh, uh, change the lives of our community members. All the time we have trauma. Um, and so I'm gonna share a very simple story with you. It's from the Snoqualmie people. You know who uh, Snoqualmie Falls is, right? Snoqualmie Falls, Snoqualmie Pass. So Palmy River, so Palmy Casino, you know all that stuff, right? Okay. And the Snoqualmie people, they're still here. And Stoqual is the moon. That in their language, Stoqual is the moon. So Snoqualmie, remember I said earlier all these names are mispronounced? Their real name is Stoqualbuk, Stoqualbuk, Stoqual, Snoqual is the moon. Buk means people of, so Snoqualmie means people of the moon. They say that they are the descendants when the moon came to the earth and prepared the world for humans. They are the descendants of those first people. But they tell a story, and I'm gonna ask you to help me tell it. At a certain point, you have to help me tell it, all right? Got that? Yeah. No, no. Right? Anybody know? Okay, good, good, okay. A long time ago. Well, first off, you guys are in college, you should know the answer to this question. 
Could all of you show me? Where is this guy? Where is this guy? Very good. High life. Who can tell me how high is this? How high is this guy? What? Very high. This guy is very high. In case you ever want to know, this guy is very high. But in this little common story, these people are up in the mountains, and so they, they tell mountain and sky stories. They're closer to the sky than the rest of us. They tell of a time when the sky was not way up there. It was dark, and it was heavy, and it was way down here. Here is where this guy was right here. And because of that, the people had to walk around like this all the time, bent over like this. This is how they walked all the time. Because they, if they stood up, they'd bump their heads in the sky. So it's not fun walking like this. You keep bumping your head. Your back starts to hurt. You can't see where you're going. You can only see your feet beneath you. And so the people began to argue all the time, yelling at each other, arguing with each other all the time. And then they began to fight, pushing each other, hitting each other. Get out of my way. You made me bump my head. And so the people were arguing and fighting all the time. Can you imagine such a time? Arguing and fighting all the time. Well, there was a little girl in a house in this village, and she saw this. She said, this is not right. My people should not be arguing and fighting all the time. There must be something I can do. And so she thought. And she thought. And she thought some more, and she had an idea. She walked out of her house to the middle of the village, put her hands on the sky, and she pushed up as hard as she could. And guess what? She felt the sky move a tiny bit. She said, huh, if I call the other people out of their houses and we push together, maybe we can push the sky up a little bit more. And so she called the people out and told them her plan. But they were grumpy. Ah, that's a crazy idea. That'll never work. She said, please try just once. They said, all right. They all put their hands in the sky. And they pushed up as hard as they could. And guess what? They felt it move a little bit more. Now, this was a very smart little girl. She said, I know, if we invite all the Indian tribes around here to come to our village, the Duwamish from Seattle, the Puyallup from Tacoma, Suquamish from, from Bainbridge Island, we invite them all to come to our village, and we all push together. Maybe we can push this guy up, push it out of our way, push it to where it belongs. And the people said, now, little girl, that's a very good idea. So all the Indian tribes were called to that Snoqualmie village up in the mountains. And the plan was explained to them how they're going to push up the sky. And everyone agreed it was a really good idea, but someone in the back yelled out, hey, hey, there's a big problem here. There's a really big problem. All the tribes around here, we all speak different languages. And it's true, they do. We all speak different languages, so we all have a different word for push. How can we push together? How can we work together? Well, the people talked and thought and argued and talked about it, but they couldn't think of anything. The people knew if you have a problem you can't solve, this is a variation. You go to the old people, the elders, because old people are, are not just smart, they're also wise. They've lived a long time. So they went, they went to this old, old man at the edge of the village, and they explained the problem to him. He said, let me think about it. Four days. Come back in four days, and I'll tell you. They came back, and the old man said, you shall use the word yahout. Yahout me work together. Yahout me push together. When I say yahout, we all say yahout and push up on that heavy sky. So, can you all say yahout? Yahout. One more time. Yahout. Yahout. Very good. I'm not even going to make you stand up. Just pretend you're pushing up the sky with your hands right here, all right? This is called audience participation. It's relatively painless, all right? So put your hands right here. When I say yahout, I you to say yahout and push up on that heavy sky. So here we go. Yahout. Is that high enough? No, it's not. Let's get some big long poles and keep pushing up little poles and using the same word. So here we go. We did it. We pushed this guy up to where it is today. And so, there's no palmy people say, if we work together, we can do great things. We can even push up the sky. So this is the story called Pushing Up the Sky, told by the Sopalmi people. What has that got to do with the topic we're talking about today? Any thoughts on that? How does this connect with, this, with the uh, place we're at, the things we're talking about today? Any thoughts? Yes? If we come together, we can solve any problem. 
if we come together, as we've done today, we can solve any problem. We can solve the problem before us. So come together, work together. But sometimes you find we speak different languages. We speak different languages coming from different cultures, cultural backgrounds. We come from different levels of education, different everything. So how can we work together? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they went to the elder who, who was really smart, but he also had the wisdom. So it's through the heart, as like you mentioned before. So the elder said, let me think about it for four days, which means he's telling them, I really think it's an important question. Let me think about it for a while. And then he came up with the word Yahweh that will help us to work together. One person said, we need a word, a belief, a philosophy that unites us all together to do this work because we're all going to have different perspectives, we're all going to have different ideas, but as long as we have one idea that we hold in common, then we can make this work. Because again, we're coming from the African American experience, that Native American experience, the, the Asian experience, the, there's Latino experience, there's all these experiences we're coming we have different stories, but can we find one thing that will hold it to? We always agree on this one thing. And again, that's what the story, the wisdom of the story is. Yes, we can work together, but sometimes it's simple to say it, but we have to work to make that happen. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say there? All right. So, any other thoughts about this story? Uh-huh. I see, like, the elder in my culture, we, we look back into history in order to move and I think um, they're the same. Um, in order to move forward, you have to face the past and walk backwards. And I think in- I'm gonna stand up and say that, okay. This is, uh, I'm getting, this is some heavy wisdom here that this young woman brings from her uh, Hawaiian background, Hawaiian native background. And so I'm humbled that she shares this all the time in the class. And go ahead and share what you just said. And make sure everybody hears, all right? In my culture, Hawaiian culture, History and genealogy is really important for us. So our belief is in order to move forward, you must look back. So we have a saying where you must face the past in order to walk to the future. So I see like the elder as like history, like store, like a living story. And I think a problem in Western culture is they don't deem history as important. So they keep making they keep making mistakes because they're. When they look back, they refuse to look back and fix what's in front of them. They refuse to like use the wisdom from the past in order to fix what's happening now. Thank you. So much. <laughs> the idea, though, that um, this story links a little girl who has a original idea and an elder who comes with the solution to make this work that we need the enthusiasm, the energy, the greed for the genius of young people to say, we need this, this is how we can solve the problem. How are we gonna do this though? Go to an elder, the elder will help you find the idea to tell you how it might work. And so again, can you see that? A cross-generational solution here. Um, the man who shaped the story said he, he changed it in the beginning, it was a, another character, he changed it to a little girl to make sure we understood the young people have the answers. They know they live in this world. They have answers. We must listen to them. And as elder people, we must help them refine it so we can make it into not just an idea, but an action. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Any other thoughts about this story? As I said in the story, the people were arguing and fighting, fighting all the time. And in my life in America of 65 years, I've never seen it like this before. I mean, it's been pretty ugly, pretty bad, it's pretty contentious, but right now there seems to be so much arguing and fighting. The story seems, I have to keep telling this story because people face these things. There are times when people, a culture falls apart. There are all times when people face struggles they cannot imagine how to solve. But this is a story that's in the here, within this story, possibilities, right? So again, for me, this story does a lot more than just what it seems to do pushing up the sky. But then I looked at it, thought about it some more. I told this, this is probably one of the oldest stories I know for about 30 years of storytelling. I thought about what does that dark and heavy sky represent? What might it represent? It could represent depression, right? That I feel like the weight of the world is upon me. I can't stand up. I can't see where I'm going. I, I, I don't know where I am. And that's depression to me. But it also could represent oppression, where another group is pushing you down and you have to live according to their rules of how to live in the world. You have to, you have to follow their orders all the time. But how do we lift either depression or oppression off of us? Yeah.
what you said, one of the most basic things to do, ask for help. Help one another, work together, right? Work together, that means we must ask each other for help. So I really believe that act of asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. That I recognize I'm among friends, and if I ask for help, they will give it to me. And if they ask for my help, I will give it to them. So again, in a cultural view, asking for help is woven in our stories all the time. Ask for help, we are truly a community. And so, the idea though, to me, is uh, we cannot move forward until we move that weight upon us. We cannot move forward until we lift that heavy sky upon us, that oppression or depression. We must do that first. And we, the story says you can't even see where you're going. So if we can't see where we're going, how can we plan for that? We must <coughs> put that depress, depression, that oppression off of us. This is what I found in the story for myself. You might, if you carry the story and tell it a few times, you might find something different. But that's powerful, that's wonderful. I'm not saying you have to agree with what I say. I'm only interpreting it from who I am. Roger Command is artist, storyteller, educator, social worker, grandfather, all these things. That's how I see the story. But you, because of who you are, might see it totally differently, and that's a good thing. But still, we find a time that it's almost describing our time right now. Something is weighing down upon us. We can feel it so heavy. And it, it, it depresses us so we can't even see the future. How do we lift that off of us? We must do it together. But to do it together, we must understand the words are easy to say, but difficult to do. So we must come to some agreements. How we will work together. How we can work together. And again, we turn to the wisdom of our elders. That's why I tell stories. These words are not new ideas. These words are not my ideas. They're the ideas of people way before me. And I'm happy to learn them. I'm happy to share them. Uh-huh. Uh, I would like to add uh, my country, uh, what incident happened. It was, first, first of all, history is really matters to me. Because I didn't knew about that after studying on sociology by our professor Bryce. So I get to know the history is really matters. So I'm from Bangladesh, the next to India, but we have our own country. Uh, on 1971, we got fight in Pakistan, and we won the battle, and it's our independent country. But from 1967 till 1971, the Pakistan people, they took our land, everything. They're killing people, and we are like helpless on that time. So there was only one person, uh, like a little girl, his name is Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. He said, no, I'm going to make my country free. Everyone was scared. Because from the Pakistan, all the weapons, tank, was, everything was happening. The Bangladeshi people was nothing. We have only like just a sword or knife, that's all we have. But from the India, they helped us a lot. So Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman told, if we get together, all together, we think we can freedom our country. And it really worked on 1971. They took action against the Pakistan, and only by hand, and a couple of guns, but they have tanks too. But we make our country independent on that time. So for me, whatever your story is matching with our country too, and as well as Martin Luther King Jr because he took all, also the action that Black Lives Matter, it doesn't matter. You can come all together, but if you're all together, we can force the sky all the way up. Thank you. This gesture, I'm completing the storytelling now because I know they have a, kind of a schedule here. This gesture of our people, native people right here, my tribe is just from 60 miles from the lower Elba cloud of people, um, but all the tribes around here put up our hands like this all the time, seen our gatherings. This means thank you, hello, you're welcome, goodbye. We lift up our hands like, we call it putting our hands to people. This is I surrender, this is I understand pushing up the roof, but this is what we do like this. <laughs> this is thank you. So I would say Hotmixen, which means thank you, Dischaja, my friends, Hotmix Dischaja, for inviting me to a special event on a special day. Thank you for allowing me to share the stories with you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with me on the stories, and I look forward to uh, seeing you all again. I teach a class here, Monday, Wednesday night, storytelling. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'll, when I'll do it again. This quarter's going pretty good, right? Is it going okay? <laughs> <laughs> they would have passed, they would have passed. <laughs> <laughs> so again, Kotlinson, thank you. Nostrajja, Kotlinson, Siam, special people. And uh, we're gonna take a break and then maybe question and answer and further discussions. So thank you very much, thank you. <laughs>
path? Did you get interested in storytelling and want to like do that? Um, I read a lot, so I love reading and acquiring stories through books. Um, when, when I was 15, one of the pivotal books I read, I didn't even plan on reading, was a, somebody left in my locker called The Dubious Battle by John Steinbeck. And he wrote the book Grapes of Wrath, which is about the struggle of the Oklahoma refugees from the Dust Bowl trying to come to California. And they were being abused by farmers and ranchers who knew they, they're poor, they're desperate, they'll work for anything. And so the idea of the book was that labor organizers try to unionize the the fields back then, um, they came to help people organize strikes and things like that. That was the first time I ever through a story understood that you can stand up and fight for something greater than yourself. Um, as a kid, you might see it in a movie, but not. But in story form, um, the labor organizers back then working the, in, the, in the fruit orchards of California, it's like they should have painted a target on their chest because they were going to get killed. And they knew that, that, but they were willing to sacrifice for the good of making sure that children were not starving, that old people were not dying of exposure, that people were dying from diseases that they could go to the hospital to get cures for, but they had no money. So they were fighting for something greater than themselves. They were willing to die for that. Again, for me as a, as a human, it was like, whoa, I didn't know that. I'm 15 years old. But that shaped me. That was a story that shaped me. But when I came to the Native American part, recognizing, working with Native American children in the schools and seeing their struggles, Native American children are smart. Just like every child is smart in school. Every child in that in school is an intelligent, genius little human being. And so it was, the question came to me as an educator, if I accept the fact that every child is intelligent and smart and creative and, and, and motivated, that there's nothing wrong with them. It must be the system then. So how do you change the system? Which led me to the question, how the system works, which led me to the question, how do children really learn versus how do, how does the system expect them to learn? And those are two very different processes. And for me, looking at the history of human beings as best I could, children learn through stories. And we've taken that from their education and had them focus on abstract concepts like reading and writing and math, when many of them are not physiologically ready for that. So the system has dictated how children learn. When humanity says that they learn through stories, so I became more and more interested in how to use storytelling to help children um, learn, because that's their, that's, that's their strength. So the more stories I learned, the more stories I learned. I mean, I would start to get more and more stories. I remind people that I started one story 30-some years ago. I only knew one story. But because of that interest and because of the opportunity, I know many stories. My teacher, Johnny Moses, he was being interviewed by a reporter, and the reporter said, so how many stories do you know, Johnny? And Johnny said, I don't know. The guy said, how about a 1,000? Johnny said, nah, more than that. How about 2,000? Mm, a little bit more. How about 2,500? Johnny said, yeah, maybe that many. So this teacher reminded me that we humans have the capacity to learn many, many stories. And the children can do that as well. And putting those stories together gives them a comprehensive foundational knowledge. So I approach storytelling as a way of teaching. And as an educator, I really believe it's the most foundational teacher there is. And um, so I would say it's probably 30 years ago, I shifted into this is how children learn. There's a great author, her name is Vivian Paley. She teaches kindergarten and uh, preschool for 40 years. And she said, children learn through story, fantasy, and play. To do anything else other than that, you're betraying them. And I took her words to heart because she is an educational warrior. This 70-year-old woman is ready to take on the whole system um, because she knows how children truly learn and why is the system of training. So, sorry for making that a bigger answer, but, but that's kind of how, how I really came to it. Thank you. Well. Anything else? Other questions or reflections? So, earlier you mentioned that the how we learn now through books and writing. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that you know, that versus the oral traditions that we used to have, our ancestors had? Sure. Again, reading and writing have not been around that long if you look at the scale of human history. So again, storytelling, creating artwork to help us remember the information we needed. Um, and that there's a book in my class, you guys can read it, it's called Oral. Oh, Orality and Literacy. Uh, and he does that very question. How did 
he said, that, what booked me in the beginning of the book was he said, um, if you meet another adult in your daily going around, school, work, whatever, and you talk to this other adult, and the person says to you, I can't read and write. He said, what's your response to that person? And mostly it's going to be, what's wrong with you? Because you can't make it as well. So we've gotten to the point where we use literacy, reading and writing, as a, um, a measure of who that person is. He said, how, how did that come to be? This is a non-native academic who's just asking a very simple question. How did that come to be that reading and writing had become the measure of humanity? And he said, that, so he began the question, well, what's the difference between orality, telling and remembering through your voice and memory and heart, and literacy, where you translate into writing and, and, and reading? And uh, several chapters were very, very insightful to me. Um, when he wrote the book back in the 1950s, there was still a lot of research going on with cultures that don't read and write. Um, there were still a lot of illiterate cultures in the world. And because, again, he's approaching a, literacy is not a measure of them, it's just part of their condition. Um, doesn't make them good or bad. Uh, he, w he went to Russia, and there was a big study that he was a part of, where they were asking these, in these Russian villages where there was hardly anybody who uh, uh, would read and write. He asked them some really simple, he says like, when you begin to read and write, everything becomes really directed. Like, he would say, and we're used to this, he was asked them a question like, um, can you tell me who you are? And the person would look at him and say, ask my neighbor. It's relational. Ask my neighbor, they'll tell you who I am. Um, or he would ask, so what is a tree? And they would look at him and say, look out the door. There's a tree out there. So they were using a different, a whole different view of communicating, a whole different view of um, how language is used. Because we've gotten used to reducing it to a word, putting the word on the page, and therefore that becomes our way of describing the world. So that's a wonderful book if you ever want to get more in depth in terms of reading and writing. But the main thing I think to me is literacy is a powerful gift that we receive. It's a powerful technology, a powerful gift, but every gift has a price. And what is the price? We've forgotten how to hear and remember stories. And um, we've shifted away from our heart to our brain. So <clears throat> without lecturing you too much more, that would be the way I'd explain it. That literacy is wonderful, I read and write all the time, but I have to always remember it comes with a cost. And I have to be aware of that cost and recognize that I can learn stories, I can learn from stories, I can tell stories, and I'm not going to give that up for the idea that literacy replaces all those things. Right. Do you think that the reading and writing actually gets in the way of the heart? I've had my class, I, I told them stories for like a couple weeks, then I had them read a story to each other in small groups, and I asked, was there a difference? And was there a difference to you, reading a story versus telling it? <laughs> huh? Yeah. How would you describe that difference? Is there a way to explain it? Reading a story is not that personal style. Reading at you, and then versus when you're telling a story, they're like more connected to you. Okay, so, so there, there is a connection. Part. Storytelling connects us. Whereas reading and writing, the, 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 the the sharing, well, what you're getting out of the book becomes internal. It becomes inside you, and you don't share it with you. Uh -huh. You said something about words being trapped. Words being book. traps. <laughs> oh, okay. She, I, I wrote a, I, I'm not a poet, but I wrote a poem anyway. Uh, because it's the beginning of trying to figure something out. I said, they took the sword that they called a pen and they captured the word. They took the word and they put it in the cell they call the page. They took the page and they put it in the prison they call the book. And they said it was good. So for me, just I'm, that's my nature is a challenging question and be contrary, I understand that. I'm an artist and I'm the oldest brother and I'm a Virgo. I mean, all those things mean I'm <laughs> you know, there's another way here. <laughs> so um, what does that cost? And I don't think most of us have given the luxury of figuring out um, there is a cost to it. Uh, so as long as we're aware that there is a price and we try to balance that out, then I believe it can work. But as long as we're told that oral tradition, that's old, nobody understands that, nobody does that, there's nothing in it to learn, um, then we forget. We're forgetting part of our humanity. And storytelling does connect us. My breath shared with your breath in the same space, that is what my teacher calls sacred, and that's what holds us together.
going back to the little brother story, because uh, don't you think it's dangerous to give wrong people choices? Let's say um, Hitler, right? Like, like uh, he believed that, like, you know, during those times, like his people, government, were like overpowered, like you know, like the used by the you know, people, people, and then like you know, whatever came up or up up out of doubt at the time. That is one of the deepest questions I've heard. I would be the old man and say, come back to me in four days and I'll show you. <laughs> because you've asked a very, very profound question, should every voice be heard? And sometimes a voice is preaching hate, discrimination, uh, they're preaching um, violence, and should we allow that voice to be spoken? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, what do you think? <laughs> you have a thought on that yourself? Uh, trying to take a leave. All right, well, so I would say I need time to think about that one. And I, we have thought about it quite a bit because we are confronted with people that are espousing racist, supremacist stories. Um, <laughs> I know they're much more philosophical people than me, but for me, then, um, it is a conversation we need to have with each other to talk about these things. So I'll just say that, all right? But it's a very good question. It makes me think. Four days, all right? Yeah. Uh, I think that question, maybe we can hear them, but not apply what they're doing. Because sometimes people speak from, they speak hate because they're speaking of from pain. Mm -hmm. So you got to, sometimes it's good to understand the pain and know the hurt. Because there, there are good things to learn from it, but we don't always have to apply the teachings. Uh -huh. Again, yeah, I, it's a complex topic. We, maybe we need to hear those voices so we understand the scale. Like, right, what's happened right now, in my opinion, is that um, because we elected a certain president, that people feel free now to express their hate, their anger. But did we imagine that they were not there? Did we imagine the problem was solved? Did we imagine that um, you know we moved on when we really never did? So maybe again, that voice needs to be heard to remind us we still have a lot of work to do. Yeah. But what is that work? Is it to punish them? Is it to educate them? Is it to reach out to them? Again, we as a group need to talk about that. Because again, it was it was interesting. There's a powerful book um, called The Culture Make Believe by Derek Jensen, and he, he positions that the the core the core value in America is hate, hate, and the American average American believes it's justice and fairness and equality, opportunity. But he said, but look at all the things America has done, and recognize that if you use the word hate, everything makes sense. So again, to try to, to try to steal that voice, um, that doesn't mean it goes away. It means it's a barrier. And we need to confront it, in my opinion, we need to confront it. And so um, again, a complex question. But again, we can talk about those things and come up with some possible answers to it. So I appreciate the question very much. My teacher said all the problems we're facing today we humans have faced before. And so it's not like we have these brand new problems no one ever seen before. I told you the story of how people were fighting and arguing all the time. Our ancestors saw that time. 
Argue, we forget. We forget the work it takes to maintain balance in the world, with each other, with the world itself, within ourselves. Maintaining balance is a lot of work. And if you forget that, things fall apart. So um, I think we just have to accept that it will always be work for us to maintain balance. But we have to be aware that to do that work, we have to get out of our comfort zone sometimes. So these stories challenge me to think in different ways. Um, and I am always in awe of the wisdom you can find within the stories that our ancestors told so long ago. So, um, as I said before, everyone in here, your ancestors, told the exact same kind of stories I'm going to share today. Can you find those stories? I encourage you, because I'm not a high tech, Kai will tell you that. Um, but you, you can type in, you know. Um, <laughs> Turkish folk tales or whatever it is, and they'll show up. And I tell people to go back and find the oldest stories you can. So if you go back and find a story from your culture that had kings and queens in it, you haven't gone back far enough. Go back before the kings and queens, to the ones where they lived with the earth and animals and other people in a certain way that was, um, I'm not gonna say more natural, but it was built on the idea of nature itself. So I really encourage you to do that. If I can help you do that, let me know. Um, but then you learn that story and you tell it. You have to tell the story for it really to be activated and to be able to start to do its work. So learn the story, memorize it, and tell it. That's all I can tell you. What will happen after that, that's what you're gonna figure out. Uh -huh. Now that you said to go back, way back, you know, um, and I'm assuming, well, you know, assuming that we all originated either fairly close or, you know, whatever theories we all believe, but since you're a storyteller and you've done this for a really long time, and I'm pretty sure from what I hear that you've listened and heard to very different, you know, uh -huh. cultures and walks of life, do you find that some of the stories are very similar, even across cultures? That's my favorite or areas? thing. Like, yes. you know, like, is there a common ground, like, even way back then? You know, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> People that live with nature find some very basic uh, understandings of the earth and how you live in the earth and they're going to share the exact same stories that we share here. Um, I shared a story with my class, one about how dog and wolf separated. Dog went to live with people, wolf stayed out in the woods. Then I have another story from Africa, how dog went to live with people and jackal stayed out in the brush. And it's the same story, so what does that mean? Um, when you find there's a story all around the world told the same way, all around North America, there is a story of women who go up in the sky world, marry a star, have a baby, bring a star baby back to Earth, and that baby changes the world for human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible, it's everywhere. It's like, wow, what is that about? Mm -hmm. um, and then you find it around the world as well. That's called a mythic story, where it's so powerful and big that not just one culture tells it, many cultures tell it. Um, there's two ideas of how that happens. One is called diffusion, that human beings can travel. Wherever they go, they take their stories with them. Therefore, you go across the mountains, those people now know your story, and then they travel across the, 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 the desert, they carry with them, and the, the stories you travel with people. That's one possible reason why we all tell the same stories. The other one is more metaphysical, and it is that based on kind of Carl Jung's explanation that we share with this thing called the um, Universal subconscious, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. The idea that one very powerful, deep spiritual level, we are all connected with each other as humans. And because we have the same human connection in our spirit, we ask the same human questions and dream the same human dreams. And because of that, we get the same stories. We tell the same stories because of that. And I'm, I'll leave you figure out which one I, I prefer. I prefer the, the second one, where we are all connected <laughs> at a very deep level. And therefore, when we find the stories that connect us, we go, Oh my gosh, the same story. I love that. Mm -hmm. I don't try to explain the story. I just accept that the people in Africa tell a story uh, about a dog and a jackal, and the people here in Puget Sound, we tell a story about a wolf and a dog. Mm -hmm. and it's the same story. That to me is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And Albert Einstein said, there are two ways to look at the world. Either nothing is a miracle, or everything is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And um, he said he prefers the latter, that everything is a miracle. So for me then, the stories are a miracle. And that the more I can connect them, uh, the better I feel. The better I learn from other people, other cultures. So that wisdom, I'm still looking for it. All right. I don't
think I'll get a PhD in wisdom, but the stories, they're good enough. That's a PhD in wisdom. Yeah. If someone has another question, if not, we can. Do you have any question for, or any story for children should be educated? Like, children should be educated in the society or in the country? For children? Yeah. Like, um, any story? Like, sorry. Um, yeah. Like, I don't even know it, I don't know. Uh, in Louisville, there's a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 70% uh, people are not educated. Mm -hmm. Like, because for the system over there, as well as the school. So in my perspective, I think what the government is trying to do uh, well on the Mexico border, with that money, they can open a school over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you have like quite similar any story for the children should be educated in the society? Like any, like? The, the idea that, well, there's several stories that have to do, they're children's stories that have to do with your, your a child's transformation in life. From a little one, a young, a little one, a young one to an adult. That you will transform in your life. Little one, young one, adult, you will transform. And that story, we have a story about a, 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 a um, animals diving under the flood waters, the great flood covers the earth. Different animal dive under the water, trying to bring up the earth to create a new world. They, they must dive beneath the flood waters to get earth, bring it back up, create a new world. And so first goes one animal that plays all the time, otter, doesn't do it. Then the next one is muskrat, who, um, who uh, uh, is busy flirting with fish and uh, thinking about himself. He almost does, but he can't do it. Finally, little beaver, they laugh at him. You can't do it, beaver, you're so little, you're so ugly, you're so fat, you can't do it, and he does it anyway. He dives four days, four days under the water, bring back the mud and creates a new world. Little one who plays, Young one who thinks of themselves, adult who changes the world. Little one, young one, adult. And then I tell people, well, that follows pretty much another story that pretty much everybody knows. It's a, it's a European folk tale. It says, when you're a little pig and you don't know very much, you make a house out of straw and grass. Is that the best house to make? The story says no, because the wolf, which represents the problem, can tear it apart. A little older, you make a house out of sticks. Better than grass, is it still the best house to make? Because a wolf, problem can still tear it apart. You get to be an old pig, wise pig, smart pig, you make a house out of bricks. bricks. In the European culture, that's the strongest house to make. No wolf, no problem can tear it apart. So there it is again, little one, young one, adult. They must know in here that I will transform in my life. I will transform, and to get to different transformations, I might need to go to school, I might need to get a job doing this, or whatever it is, they realize that transformation will happen, and I will be a part of that transformation. Um, and then you look at the Three Little Pigs story, in the dream language, a house represents your life. So how do I make my life so strong that no problem can tear it apart? And again, this is the depth of the stories the old people would tell. From Europe, from Africa, from everywhere in the world, they were telling these stories, little one, young one, adult. That's how it would start with children. Little one, young one, adult, you can transform in your life. Once they were sure of that, now we fill it in with some of the details. So thank you for asking that question. As I said before, among our people here, we do this all the time. We don't applaud, we go like this. And this is what I'm so used to. I even do it, instead of applauding at a concert, I go like this. Um, it means you lift me up. This gesture means you lift me up. Um, you lift up my heart, you make me happy. It's symbolic of that feeling. But it's also, if you look at outside, see all the cedar trees around? Um, cedar tree is a great gift given to the native people. Everything you need, the cedar tree will give to you and ask for nothing in return. And so when you look at the cedar tree, look at the top branches, the top branches are like this. Our people say, look at the cedar tree, giving thanks every day. We must give thanks every day like the cedar tree. So again, I want to say thank you again for inviting me to a special event. Hopkinson, thank you again for letting me share these stories with you. Thank you for your insights, because those always help me. Because I don't know everything, and your sharing with me helps add more to the depth of the story. So I appreciate that very much. And I hope to see you again. Hopkinson and Stripe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.